Uh, Lynn Chow joins me here. She's Lynn. I'm Corey. Um, and uh, uh, and we're the Kleiner Perkins. So one of the one of the you know the the great venture capital firms in Silicon Valley that has a long history of, of a lot of innovative investing, not least of which in in healthcare and and you know Genentech was how many years ago for the for your firm? It was in the 1970s. 1970s. Wow. In healthcare. Thank you. So I thought I'm curious about kind of what you do. Uh, with your companies and, and how the role of, of venture capitalists is more than finding a good company to invest in and telling the, the, the board or, or sitting on the board and telling the CEO not to do stupid things. Yeah. Um, talk to me about what you do with big healthcare companies and helping them see Silicon Valley through uh, your eyes or, or see what they, you want them to see. No, I mean, I think it all stems from helping our portfolio companies and those companies that we choose to invest in and who choose us as partners to really drive value in the healthcare system. And we always look at every company and we say, okay, how can we help this company through its life cycle and stages? And it's a really important part of how we partner with our companies, both myself and uh, Beth Seidenberg, who also works at Kleiner and focuses on digital health, have operating backgrounds. So it's very core to our being in terms of how we work with the companies and truly being, I hate to say, almost old fashioned about venture capital in that what we ultimately want to do is have the company succeed to the best of its abilities and for us to help it along the way. And that's how we see our role with these companies. So a part of that, Corey, and what you're talking about is bringing strategics to the table. Um, I think there's a very simplistic curve of we have great entrepreneurs coming into the space and you've heard all day entrepreneurs who come from the tech world or from the healthcare world coming and innovating in digital health. They then get funded, the investors, and we know that 4.3 billion has gone into the space last year and the prior year before that. And so record years in digital health. So those two ends of the circle are there. But the third and one of the most important is to bring value to the healthcare system. And that ultimately means working with strategics, if that's providers, payers, employers, um, overall. And so how do we then work with our portfolio portfolio companies to bring value to the healthcare system, which will ultimately lead to, you know, great companies being born. And that's really what we try to do. So as a part of that, we actually bring strategics into Kleiner Perkins um, and we create forums for our portfolio company CEOs because I think that's where we are in the crux of this system. You've heard of all the digital health investors, a lot of my peer group here previously. It's not about the dollars going in, but we really have to build value. So an example of that is um, over JP Morgan, which probably many of you know is focused in San Francisco. So and the the very JP Morgan big Healthcare Conference, formerly the H&Q exactly, Healthcare Conference. So after exactly. H&Q gets acquired by Chase, Chase gets acquired by JP Morgan, and they tried to shut down the conference. They really had no interest in that business, and now it's one of the most important gatherings Absolutely. of healthcare. And I would say, you know, we talked about HIMSS on the last panel, but that's really providers focused. JP Morgan really takes providers, payers, uh, the public market investors, private market investors, truly the whole kind of sector of healthcare is represented at JP Morgan. And I always joke around with our partners, they always ask me, what's going on in San Francisco? Why do we see all the suits? And I was like, well, welcome to healthcare. <laughs> We're here. They're not used to not having the hoodies that we see in Dreamforce and other other areas. So that is healthcare at the they, heart. They march core. into our Bloomberg uh, uh, studios for, to do interviews during that week. And it's sort of hilarious to see these guys in the suits because as we all know in San Francisco, you only wear a suit if you're going to court or you're trying to impress New Yorkers or both, <laughs> exactly. both of which should be avoided. Um, I, I wonder though, when, when you are, uh, I'm not sure which is worse, uh, uh, when, you, when you're in that process of bringing these big companies into Silicon Valley to see your companies, to see the startup culture, what is the, the big lesson you want them to walk back with? Because it might not be a deal with one of those companies, although that would be ideal. Yeah. It's, I think what we're trying to foster here is how do you partner with innovation? And I think there are three major things happening in healthcare in the US. One is structural change via ACA, consumerism, we've talked about those themes, the technological change, which we've talked about today. But the third, which really has to be talked about is the cultural change. You know, technology for the healthcare system is not what I'd call a core competency. It's not a, a muscle they're used 
to flexing, right, in terms of thinking about innovative models and how technology changes it. And so when we bring these companies in, one of the things we really want to talk about is how do you bring innovation if you're working at a Kaiser or if you're working at United or Humana or what it might be. So how do you seed that innovation in? How do you create phase one implementations? We say that, not pilots, because there's a lot of pilots to nowhere, as we say. And then how do you create... The Amelia Earhart model. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oakland it doesn't go anywhere, Earhart. not a good thing. And then how do we create real metrics of what success looks like that both the startup company and the strategic can agree on? And if those metrics are met, which is so important, it has to be on both sides, then there's regional rollout, national rollout. And that's a process that we continually try to honestly um, talk with the strategics about in terms of how they're paying for the innovation, how they're bringing in, how they're implementing it, and how they're rolling it out. And I think all of us around this table, if you're an entrepreneur or if you're an investor or otherwise, I think we all have a concerned effort to make sure that we can do this in rapid iterative cycles that are value add and move the needle and really get to, as an entrepreneur, large, meaningful contracts and bringing value to the healthcare sector. So the suits get off the planet at, at SFO or even San Jose, God forbid, and they, um, they, uh, they, they go on a tour of Silicon Valley. What's a bad tour look like? And what does a good tour look like for them, given their yeah, objectives? Yeah, I think the, the good tour looks like for them, and what I always say is, you can, you know, we've all seen it, go to Google, you can come to Kleiner, you can meet a lot of companies, you can see the driverless car, you can, I think that's good for just opening the mind for what I call the cultural change of what has to happen in healthcare. But where the real rubber meets the road and where real things get done is when a strategic, and when you force the strategic to really ask, what are your real needs and what are you going to drive innovation and execution in? Not, you know, sitting, and I'll, I'll be extreme, um, where strategics come in, and there might be 15 people around the table and the heads of various functional units, and there's no interaction, there's no articulation of where they're really going to drive progress and change in the business. So that is important, that first conversation. And that conversation be should be before they get off the plane. That should be when you're setting up what are the needs and then bringing the companies that can really deliver partnerships and add value into their ecosystem. And that's a really important that the right people are around the table and that those needs are there. And then ultimately it gets down to who's gonna pay for that. And making sure that if it's a business unit leader who has the PL budget, or if it's the chief innovation officer who has a PL budget, that they're there, they're listening, they're interacting, and it's beyond the 30 minute pitch it's really about here's what we do and how can we help you. And I would even emphasize this even more if you're an entrepreneur is sometimes we think these giant companies know what they need. But actually, I think that, again, because of this cultural change, don't be afraid to archetype what a partnership could look like and be really upfront with a strategic on what that could be to help them archetype how they bring you into their particular company. You said foster innovation, and that's, I'll, I'll just say that's a, a super vague term that we hear a lot, but since we're talking about so many companies, there's no good answer to the, the, what I will ask you, which is, what do you think the, those big healthcare companies really want out of startups, um, even out of this area? Are there sort of specific tasks they want, or do they just want this sort of this Ponce de Leon, it's like youth injection or innovation injection without a no notion of what that is? No, I think if, I think it would be more about the youth injection, as you're saying, and the, the thought of innovation, if the structural change of healthcare wasn't happening. And it is. And so they're being forced to change. If that's on a provider side from what we call fee-for-service to value-based care, they know they have to deliver care differently. But what I'm what I think is important is they might not be able to articulate how this technology company or this startup can help them. So you have to help articulate that as well. 
and that's where the partnership begins. So I actually think they're forced to with the structural change of what's happening, and they know they need to change. And then, of course, meaningful use was helpful in terms of digitizing the data from the provider systems right. to make it accessible, and now we have to unfetter that, right, and so take it out of the silos to make it usable for innovative companies. But all those things are happening, so I don't think it's just... Uh, what I call innovative window shopping, where they come in right. to the Silicon Valley for the day. I think they know that they need to change. You got they a just driverless don't cloud anywhere? Yeah. Um, do do you? Um, it sounds therefore it must be really easy to be an entrepreneur of a healthcare technology company in Silicon Valley, since they're all shopping, they're all seeing change. Well, and that's where the hard work. They're they're shopping. They and they see the change that has to happen, but they don't know. I mean, it's like being aboard. Um, you know, a large ship, right? And you're trying to turn the ship around and these are thousands and thousands of people working in divisions, right? I mean, and it's very hard to change. So, you know, if you prescribe to like a Clay Christensen theory of how you bring innovation in or otherwise, I think there are a lot of ways to bring that innovation in, but it has to start from the needs. It has to be a partnership of how you're first gonna introduce it in and what are those metrics of success? And I would argue also to have people from the company shepherding this along from the whole life cycle of the feedback loop to those metrics, and then talking about how to expand it beyond. And that might be as a separate business unit that could be through acquisition, it could be through partnership, right? And we've also seen a lot of strategics who are as well investing in the space. So if it's a provider or payers, we've seen them as strate strategic venture investors. And we saw a lot of those people on the stage in the last talk as well, where they're bringing operational agreements along with equity checks as a typical venture investor. Can I actually give some context? Talk about what you did on the operational side. Yeah, so um, before this, I actually worked at Abbott Vascular launching medical devices. Um, through Europe, uh, Asia, and the US uh, for the last eight years before that. Um, so have really worked with clinical data, selling to providers, working with reimbursement, regulatory, uh, ops, sales, uh, market access, et cetera, and to really bring uh, truly innovative um, products to market in various countries. I mean, we've been talking a lot about U.S. healthcare, but the whole international healthcare too. There's a lot of change that that needs to happen. And well, on selling medical devices, uh, one, I think one of the interesting things we talked on the phone a few weeks ago, and, and uh, uh, this notion of, of you're you're an entrepreneur of a company, you've invented a solution to a problem, so that a consumer can get the benefit of that. But what you described to me on the phone was that, that you have this very different notion that it's not B to C, it's B to B to C. And if, and if you're the first B, you need to be thinking about uh, the, the second and maybe a bigger B. Explain that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, it's like shopping on Amazon, and we've, we've seen that. It's not that today. It is a very opaque system where who's paying, who's receiving the services, and who's giving the services are all different ecosystem partners. And so when you see that reality, now that reality will change over time, but today we're really in a business to business to consumer business model. So we frequently see entrepreneurs who come in wanting to do a B2C approach, and then a year later understand that really to get true volume of patients and consumers um, and providers on the system, you really have to go to a more B2B2C approach. And so when you make that mental shift, to where our health healthcare system is today. And I think we will have more B2C elements of healthcare as we roll forward with more high deductible plans and some of the business plans that were presented today. So we'll get there, but we're not there yet. And so in that type of framework of thinking, it's really important for those entrepreneurs who are out creating digital health business models is think about your business model much earlier than you, ha you thought before and think about who's paying for healthcare, right? Which is the government employers. And we have a lot of portfolio companies that look to employers as payers. Um, and, and really think through that model of who's getting the value and who's going to pay for it. And there will always be iterations through your companies, but I think starting from that base is always important. 
And, you know, I think gone are the days of this is a great technology. It really has to be an end-to-end -end business model that works in healthcare. And so I think that's a really important framework with which to start. And I think as we move healthcare and the structure of healthcare changes, we will become a more B2C model um, over time. You said who's getting the value and think of that. Can't value be, be, aren't there multiple definitions of value or multiple sort of instances of value? Would the value to the patient who gets her toe fungus fixed, <laughs> thinking of Valiant right now. That's definite value. That's great value. But the value to Valiant or to Philidor, the specialty pharmaceutical company, that's a financial value that's, that's, that's different than the ultimate value to the patient. Absolutely. So you really have to break up your customer segments. And I think this is really important. If you're talking to providers, let's say, I don't think that's a definitive customer segment because within providers themselves, there are various types of providers. There's what value means to an academic hospital. There's what value means to a community hospital. There's value to what an employer on-site clinic, which is a provider and a GP-like service, what does value mean to them, right? And, or an ACO, or if you're an independent physician practice. So I think it's so important exactly what you said is to understand the B2B2C model, break down who's really driving, who's truly your customer, and then break it down again. We've talked about employers on this stage. There is a completely different value proposition for jumbo employers versus mid-size employers versus small employers. And we've seen that with different models um, attacking that. So you really have to understand what value means to them because there are complete different definitions. So as you look at this um, uh, evolving way, what, what do you feel like the value that Kleiner brings that you try to really think differentiate into you guys or that, that really sort of makes you, a, I don't know, you know, pat yourself on the back with a, as a better investor, but what do you think companies really get out of that partnership that you really think is unique in the way you guys focus? Um, and I'll, I'll say this in a really humble way. Um, you know, this is what I would believe we give to our CEOs and to our entrepreneurs. I always say you should ask our entrepreneurs who we've invested in what we've given value to. Um, but what my hope is, is if you were to interview them, is they would say that we are true partners. And that means in terms of BD relationships and opening this up, strategic thought partners in terms of who in the healthcare ecosystem uh, we bring forward operational partners in that a lot of our partners at the firm have had operational experience launching products and can understand how hard that is. We're team builders. We have four full-time recruiters that recruit from board level all the way to people coming right out of the straight technical programs at 15 of the largest universities um, for developers, product designers, product management. We have people like John Mieta, who is the former president of RISD, who really is what Rhode, we call Rhode our Island chief. School of Design, who's, we've, we had a Bloomberg TV a bunch, and some of our Bloomberg uh, technology conferences is mind-blowing every time he talks. I, at least I find it And fun. we basically parachute him into our companies, and he works with our design teams and our product teams to think about the design experience. We call him our chief product officer. Uh, we have Bing Gordon, who was one of the founders of Electronic Arts, and who really has thought about product and engagement. Um, he's on the board of Amazon and Zynga. Do you do a Bing Gordon imitation? Because everyone has <laughs> He always kind of, of like, like this. yeah, he's got his hair, his, you know, you know, perfectly coiffed hair. Looks he's like he's actually, Incredibles I don't know if you know this, yes. he's a great poet. So after ev player. every meeting, he writes a poem about what we've talked about or what we've learned within, you know, 15 minutes of just sitting down. That's... That's the creativity of what's happening there. Awesome. Um, and, you know, so I think that partnership, and I think the other part of the firm and, and um, is that we've been long-term investors in healthcare, and we've been long-term investors in the digital world. And we understand the power of both of these attributes that have to be intertwined in digital health. And so healthcare is not new to us, nor is the, you know, I would say how technology can enable business models and platforms across different sectors. So I think 
that's where our perspective we come from. You know, we work every day for our entrepreneurs. Um, I really believe that, and that's where we want the value to come from. Can you talk about long term and those introductions to those big uh, potential customers, uh, big pharma firms, and so on. Those partnerships. I wonder also when you look at those, um, the closing of those deals is slow. Right? It takes a long time for those partnerships to come to fruition. I've got to imagine that's something you guys are focused on. Is that changing, though? Are they getting faster to close deals? Yeah, I, I think it's always been something that we've striven for. One thing that we help with is, again, you know, understanding the strategics, who's really leaning forward in your customer segmentations and your spaces, working with channel partners, which we know can be influencers with certain segments, if that's... Uh, with providers, there are certain groups that gather these providers together and think about innovation. Same on the employer side. So we work with all of those groups. And I think as this technology change happens and this cultural change, that they will be much more proficient in talking about what they want, integrating that in and creating the value. So I think over time, it will just be a shorter cycle. But we are at a really big point right now where we have to prove that together. And maybe the last word for the entrepreneurs out there, like, like is, is, the, is there sort of one thing they should be setting their sights on as they look forward into growing their companies? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, what we talked about is, I think the biggest thing is thinking about that business model, getting, if it's an advisor group, or even, you know, venture capitalists or other entrepreneurs that can help you brainstorm through that, even though it might seem early in the cycle, market testing that and and really doing the research around that to understand where the pain is and who's going to pay for that is really important early on. And so highly suggest, because there's a lot of business model innovation and an actual change happening in the industry, and so really understand where the puck is heading and try to evolve towards that is really important. All right, terrific. Lynn Chow, thank, thank you very you much. Guys.